yet because I love to do my art when I'm not being talked about or talked to and then afterwards um, just release it. I love my wife so much. I love you, Wesley. I love you, Evan. Um, you guys are amazing. You guys, it wouldn't be possible. These CDs wouldn't be possible without you. My whole entire team, you guys matter more than anybody I could ever say. I hope you guys are having a great day. A great day. So I used to be a special education teacher for a couple of years. Hey, no, it's in the car cop. Uh, I just wanted to give you a call and say that I heard from Emily about the post that you put up, and I just wanted you to know that that post is very stigmatizing, offensive, um, and incorrect. And I know that we have had stuff in the past, but you have completely left out that I have sincerely apologized to you. Um, and no, the thing is about people online that it is easy for you to judge because you never have anyone talking about you ever. And when you have somebody talking about you all the time, especially exaggerating things that aren't true, uh, it gets to a point where you want it to be known that it's not true. So I wanted you to know that the post you put up was one of the most offensive, demeaning things I have ever read in my life. And I think that you should be sincerely ashamed for yourself for um, ever, ever, ever basically telling people who I am, acting like you know me. Noah, we have never met in person. I do not love you. You do not love me. You. Just know who I am, man. Through recent events and serious threats, I have decided that I can no longer keep quiet about what really happens in McCafferty. Although everyone at times is susceptible to detrimental behavior through fear and anger, when it continuously comes at the expense and safety of others, I believe it is an issue. I want to let you all know that Nick is not the person he makes himself out to be online and in person. He is aggressive calculated and relentless in seeking his own peace of mind through abusing others. He constantly uses a victim mentality when confronted about his behavior and passes the blame to his true victims. Warning, everything from this point on is extremely graphic. How do you explain McCafferty to someone? Is it even possible? I don't know. To a casual onlooker, McCafferty appears no different than your run-of-the-mill punk band. Power chords, f-bombs, and a distaste for authority. But McCafferty has one thing separating them from their contemporaries. For better or worse. What's up guys, my name is Nick Hartkop. These are my friends and our band's name is McCafferty. Thank you. Nick Hartkop. Without Nick, there is no McCafferty. Nick Hartkop is McCafferty. He began writing and releasing songs under the name McCafferty in 2011. Since then, he's become a cult figure in the underground DIY punk scene, adored unconditionally by many. Even from McCafferty's early work, it was clear Nick was operating purely on passion. His words have a self-aware quality to them, he knows they're imperfect and sometimes trite, but sings them with such conviction and honesty, you can't help but be enraptured by them. And it's hard to say I'll be alright, I'll die for you, I'll die tonight, I never had a chance to say I missed you man, but anyway. For nearly 10 years, Nick and friends have been growing the McCafferty family and fanbase. They've released three LPs, way too many EPs, some splits, and have traveled the world with one another. They accomplished what many only set out to do. But on January 30th, 2020, the band's history would change forever. After years of alleged abuse and mistreatment, former lead guitarist Evan Graham posted a statement on Instagram. It detailed what actually goes on in McCafferty versus what people think goes on. It wasn't the first time Nick had been publicly put on blast, but it was the first time he'd been publicly called out by one of his own band members. Nick pleaded with me over the phone yesterday to convince Wes's girlfriend to delete a post regarding an allegation made about Nick. After becoming irate, he began his usual tirade. 
Among the things that were said were calling Wes and I fucking faggots and telling me that my daughter is going to starve, threatening my daughter's safety by commandeering the band's money and kicking me out in an attempt to get me to take his side. In addition to this, because he knows my girlfriend has suffered from postpartum depression, he told me that my girlfriend is going to put a bullet in my daughter's head, showing a total lack of empathy for my girlfriend's mental struggles. This is also not the first time he has spoken about my one-year-old daughter in a way that makes me sick. Coming from someone who openly states he is an advocate of the mental health community, there is a conflict of interest when it comes to his public face and what he says and does in private. He went on by calling Wes's girlfriend and my girlfriend sluts. All of this in response to a statement saying he sent Wes an Instagram story response saying rape her in regards to a picture of Wes's girlfriend sleeping. On top of everything said, he told me over the phone that he was driving up to Ohio with a hammer to kill Wes and damage his house. Which under normal circumstances would be passed off as a joke or an exaggeration, but given the context and his state of mind, it needed to be taken seriously as a threat. It also needs to be taken seriously because this behavior has the potential to worsen the next time he has an episode until he ends up hurting someone. This is far from anything out of the ordinary as Nick uses intimidation and threats in an attempt to control others and puts on an act of remorse and innocence to gain trust afterwards. He has told Wes and I personally that he has domestically assaulted his wife by pinning her against the wall by her throat. He's also participated in animal abuse by dragging his ex-wife's dogs onto a street in response to his ex-wife divorcing him. He has sent nude photos to an underage girl while in college and constantly lived in fear that this would resurface during our run doing McCafferty professionally. Since attempting to make amends to his fan base for his past homophobic comments, he has time and time again made it clear to me that he has not changed as he constantly uses the word faggot as an insult during disagreements and conversation, while also sometimes referring to others as retard and the n-word. He has also held the band's money over my head by saying things like, good luck feeding your family. I'm a full-time student pursuing a degree and mostly rely on the band's income. You can be assured that this pattern of toxic behavior has carried over into many more instances of similar episodes. Trust me when I say the best thing is to not give him any more attention with this band. I have seen it slowly worsen his condition as it gives him a platform to punish others while using his fans' approval, many of which are kids, as reassurance that he is in the right or that he is held in high esteem. He checks all threads and posts regarding McCafferty incessantly because he is obsessed with his public image and fearful of others' disapproval, which in turn results in his harmful and unhealthy behavior. He will not begin to get better until he realizes what he puts others through for his own mental comfort. The attention this band receives is making him more manic. He will try to victimize himself after this statement and will say anything to dispute these comments. He will probably use his wife to try and vouch for his innocence as well. He may even try to lie about me in an attempt to damage my credibility. I have nothing to hide and am prepared to stand by all the statements I have made. Nick has even threatened legal action against all of us for defamation. All the toxic behavior mentioned will not stop and will get worse until it is acted on. Thank you. Evan Graham the statement was met with support and was fully backed by Wes Easterly, McCafferty's now former drummer. To whom it may concern, I'd like to take a moment to say I 100% support the recent statement made by my close friend Evan containing information about our former bandmate, Nick Hartkop. I can attest to Evan's statement. It is very unfortunate the things Nick has done and said. It is difficult to speak up on these things and I'm very proud of Evan for having the courage to do so. The truth is the truth and people deserve to be aware. That is all for now. Wes. Get up for Wesley, everybody! Yeah! He's so awesome. At this date and time, McCafferty has two members, Nick and Emily Hartkop. Emily being Nick's wife. Chris Joekin was the first of the original members to leave in 2018, after opting not to rejoin the band after one of their many breakups. His departure was followed by Wes Easterly late 2019, then Evan Graham in early 2020. Since Evan's statement, a 70 plus page Google document has been compiled. The document explains why Nick Hartkop no longer deserves a platform. It also contains individual testimonies that corroborate and add legitimacy to Evan and Wes's statements. Today we'll be taking a look at the rise and fall of McCafferty and the testimonies against Nick Hartkop. Nick's ex-friend and ex-manager Daisy pieced together this document. Formerly known as Noah, Daisy used to assist McCafferty and help Nick with day-to-day -day operations. The document opens with a quick story detailing what the document is and why it exists. McCafferty is an indie punk band out of Akron, Ohio. They were well known for having several breakups as a result of their frontman, Nick Hartkop. 
Many of them came from his penchant for harassing people online and having mental breakdowns. In 2018, I, Daisy, publicly denounced him after he personally harassed me through voicemail, email, and social media and the band broke up again. He returned later that year, claiming that he had worked very seriously on his mental health. Their bassist Chris, however, didn't come back, and Nick opted to replace him with his current wife, Emily. He convinced me to delete my testimony, and I did, but not before saving a copy. Around New Year's 2020, McCafferty's drummer Wes left the band after Brooke privately called out Nick for advocating for abuse survivors despite his history of making rape jokes. A few weeks later, their guitarist Evan also left after Nick went on a rant about Hobo Johnson being a rapist, but refused to acknowledge Brooke's frustrations. She publicly called him out, and Nick harassed multiple people, including Wes and Evan, the latter posting a testimony on his Instagram announcing his departure. The testimony included many recalled instances of abuse and threats that Evan witnessed Nick carry out on all three bandmates, his bandmate's girlfriends, Evan's infant daughter, Nick's ex-wife Lindsay, and Lindsay's dogs. Wes would go on to confirm everything Evan posted, and Nick's ex-wife did the same on a newly created Reddit account. From that point on, more people began to break their silence and reach out. Many years ago, Nick Hartkop worked at a restaurant with a cook named Ryan McCafferty. Ryan McCafferty loved a girl in high school, but broke up with her when he went off to college, thinking that he was being responsible by not attempting a long-distance relationship. Long story short, he never moved on from her and wishes he never would have broken up with her. Upon hearing this story, Nick made the observation that instances occur like this all the time. Undocumented, sad, tragic stories. Ryan's story not only inspired Nick to name his band McCafferty, but also inspired him to write the untold stories of people, which can be seen in tracks like Floorboards, where Nick sings from the perspective of a pregnant woman. McCafferty originated from a small city in Medina, Ohio, with a population just under 30,000. In 2011, Nick released the first collection of McCafferty songs on an EP titled Moms and Dads. The EP contained nine tracks and was released when Nick was doing McCafferty by himself. Compared to the material that would follow, this EP is underwhelming but still comes across as heartfelt and sincere on Nick's end. The first few years of McCafferty's existence are what laid the foundation for the gargantuan fanbase they have today. Releasing a lot of music very quickly helped them get their name out there. In 2012, McCafferty released two EPs, Japan and Dance Beats to Hurt Girls. Both releases feature just Nick and his acoustic guitar. McCafferty fans are devoted. They know everything there is to know about the band, and eat up every detail they can about Nick and his personal life. When you see fans discussing McCafferty, there's a sense of unconditional love that you don't sense from other fan bases. Maybe it's Nick's charisma or ability to earn the trust of others, but nonetheless, they're putty in his hands. I've never seen a band or a person receive as many chances as McCafferty and Nick Hartkop, and still manage to find a way to mess it up. For kids and young adults in the DIY slash punk scene, Nick acts as a bastion of hope for those battling illnesses such as depression and anxiety. But despite the support he still receives, Nick has multiple testimonies against him regarding mistreatment of now former fans. The first testimony comes from Bree, a former fan that stayed with Nick and Lindsay while helping them with their studio EP. Hi, my name is Nicholas Harkop. I'm born November 16th, 1992. I'm six foot three. After reaching out to McCafferty just to send in a song I sang with another artist, Nick asked me to come to Ohio and record backup for an upcoming album. I was ecstatic and felt like my dreams were coming true, and it really motivated me to work on getting help for my depression and anxiety so that I could be in a good headspace when I got there, and basically working with them became my reason to live as I was really struggling at the time. When I arrived in Ohio, I had a trial run with Nick where I sold merch at a show for him to see if I would be a good fit to go on tour with them. Before the show, Nick became very paranoid, and as I set up merch, I found out that he was at his home and punched a hole through the wall and almost canceled the show. I came up on a separate week on his invitation to their house. Early in the week, Nick sat me down when I felt like things were actually going pretty well and told me out of nowhere, Lindsay fucking hates you, and throughout the week built a narrative surrounding Lindsay insulting me. As it turns out, Lindsay never said any of this. She expressed her discomfort at him inviting a stranger girl to live with them for a week without asking her. Of course she would be upset. I don't hold that against her. And I agree, it was a really weird thing for him to do. Had I known that he hadn't even asked Lindsay if I could stay, I would have booked a hotel. I even offered to do this, but he insisted to have me in their home. 
The week was filled with statements that would catch me off guard. Nick at one point told me I was hot and that would help me sell merch, and it made me uncomfortable. I constantly had to ask him not to use words like faggot, retarded, and the n-word. I asked him to stop making rape jokes because I was dealing with PTSD and they really weren't funny to me. He argued that it was his dark sense of humor and that I had to have a thick skin, and never apologized or tried to censor himself. Several times I was warned that Nick loved to streak and thought it was the funniest thing ever. I made it clear that I was uncomfortable around nudity and very seriously asked him not to do that while I was working on my mental health. Sure enough, during recording, he flashed by me streaking. He knew that it would trigger me and he did it anyway, and thought it was hilarious. Nick insinuated that I was autistic or similar, which completely caught me off guard because he was a special ed teacher at the time and he should have known that if I had been atypical to not alienate me or try to make it shameful in any way. Nick had invited me to stay with them, I believe, as a way to psychologically abuse Lindsay, by having another girl in the house which was one of his many calculated manipulations throughout the week. All of the insults were his toward me, and he hid behind Lindsay to try to make her the bad guy. I'm ashamed to have not figured out for so long that he was behind creating a villain narrative for a wonderful girl like Lindsay. Fuck Nick. Evan and Wes were nice, though. Okay. What makes all of these testimonies so interesting are the similarities that lie within each of them. While there aren't any court cases or legal documents surrounding these events, we can still explore them and form our own ideas on what we think occurred. From this point on, for every new testimony, keep mental notes about each one and you'll find the consistencies disturbing. Tyler was another former McCafferty fan who became concerned about Nick's past behavior after obtaining disturbing information from one of his friends. He reached out to Daisy about this, who at the time was still working with Nick and McCafferty. Hey, have you spoken to Nick of McCafferty about his personal life and divorce? Yes, I have. I was told some things last night. And I'm like at the point where I'm debating getting my tattoo covered up based on what I was told. What tattoo and by who? I have a McCafferty tattoo, lol, and it was by one of my close friends who is close with his wife. What did they say? I don't know what Nick said and what was told to me was said in confidence, but it was just in regards to his actions while heading into his separation and divorce. What I was told was that after a fight, Lindsay left and he left voicemails in which he threatened to murder her and her dogs, and she still has them saved and used them to get everything after the divorce. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Any sort of domestic violence does not fly with me and like it's been driving me nuts since I was told. I'll talk to Nick later because I was going to work with him on podcast stuff, but I won't be comfortable with that until we talk. I won't mention your name, you've done nothing wrong. Alright, cool. I just don't want my friend to be like, what the fuck, you shouldn't have told me one. Nick says it's false. By chance, is the friend named... No. He said that some person stalking Emily, so he was just making sure. So he's saying he didn't leave voicemails that she has saved on her phone? That's what he said. And he said he didn't threaten to kill her dogs. Did he mention anything about breaking windows at her house and cops coming? That was also part of it. No. He said there have been no issues between them since. He just showed me an email where they're very friendly. Hmm, if that's what he says, I have no reason not to believe him. He said the window thing is misinterpreted and someone trying to cause drama. He locked himself out while living there and had to break a window to get in, which he replaced. That's what he says. I'm staying neutral here unless you can hear those voicemails. Yeah, I haven't heard them myself. Next time I hang out with the person, I'll ask about them to see if they can get them. Obviously, I would never want to cause drama or do one of those call-out posts, but the accusations were pretty serious and I didn't know what to do. I'm a survivor of abuse myself, so I'm taking this very seriously. Nick is adamant that things are positive between them and what you were told only has tiny, partial truths. Like he said, at one point he was bitter about the dogs because he felt like Lindsay loved him even less than the dogs because I know that's one issue they had. But he says the threats are false. He said they never went to court and he willingly gave everything to Lindsay. I was told a big part of the divorce was that Nick wanted kids and Lindsay didn't. I was told that Nick wanted stuff but she held the voicemails over him. Also the house and everything was only in her name to begin with. And I guess he was a serial cheater, even cheated on her the night before their wedding. He said there are zero court documents and police reports to back up anything you said or were told. Oh, they didn't say anything about being hidden, but they spoke to me in a conversation when we hung out. They are one of my best friends and I doubt they told anyone else other than me. They didn't say this stuff regarding drama or spreading rumors. I know they were friends with Lindsay, so asked how they felt about McCafferty since the divorce and all that stuff. Didn't you work with Lindsay? Or is that someone else? A friend of mine worked with her. She was his boss. Not sure if they still work together or not. 
Hearing that he says it didn't happen makes me feel a lot better, to be honest. Yeah, dude, I call bullshit. She sent this to Nick 10 minutes ago. Oh, wow, that's great. Next time I'm with the person that said all that negative stuff, I'll try and figure out why they said it and where it came from. Daisy shows Tyler an email Lindsay recently sent Nick, and everything was well as far as Tyler and Daisy were concerned. Oh my gosh, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. I'm really happy this is working out for you. I'm so proud you're sticking with it. The world deserves to hear your art. I'll let you know if I'm ever free when you guys are in town. I know there was talk of you guys getting to go overseas this year. Do you think you still might go? Then there's a crossed out portion where Nick replied, but the final sentence reads, You're an awesome person too. I really mean it when I say, if you need anything, I'm here for you. Or any of the other guys too. Just from these two testimonies, we can already see glaring similarities. Those being lies, deception, and calculated manipulation. When asked about the terrible acts that supposedly surrounded his divorce, pay attention to how Nick responds. He starts off by saying, no, it's false. Then moves on to saying that some of it was misinterpreted just for the sake of causing drama. And finally says that there were only tiny, partial truths in what Tyler was told. Nick states that there are no legal documents to support what Tyler has said or been told. Which is true, there aren't any legal documents to back the claims up. However, this confirmation from Lindsay proves to be interesting. Ah yeah, I vaguely know Tyler. He's talking about my friend Blank. He was a huge support when we split up. Blank came to my house and helped move Nick's stuff out that he just abandoned there. All this stuff that Tyler said is true except the cheating before our wedding night. I mean it's possible, but I don't know that to be true. I was very positive with him throughout the whole divorce process because I honestly just wanted it to be over with. And I know that being negative with Nick is never the way to get him to do something. With instances like this, it's important to acknowledge that it is one person's word against another's with no evidence. But to contrast that, it's equally important to acknowledge that this isn't an isolated incident. There comes a point when you have to look at the totality of the circumstances, especially in a case like this where there are zero legal documents involved. And you have to ask yourself, did these 16 people who testified against Nick get together and collaborate on these testimonies to make them similar and consistent in an effort to take Nick down? Only you can answer that for yourself. But one thing's for sure. The alleged lies keep coming, and the alleged situations become more graphic and disturbing. If any of the testimonies so far have caused you discomfort, stop watching now. It gets worse.